And so this is why a different theory, known as the exemplar theory of categorization, proposes that uh, what we do is actually store in memory um, all, the, all the exemplars that we've encountered in the past. Um, so any exemplar you've encountered, you really retain that. And, and when you meet a new exemplar, the way in which you, you, you categorize it is by comparing it to all the uh, exemplars that you have uh, stored in your memory. Now, th this theory does say that if needed, you can also extract a, a prototype, but not necessarily. Um, the important point for this theory being that you bring with you your experience. You bring with you the history of the um, examples you've seen. And see, this would explain um, why we can have context effect. If I, if I grew up in, you know, in the US, then, um, robins would be very typical birds to me, but if I grew up in Australia, maybe uh, rainbow lorikeets would be, you know, very typical birds to me. Now, is there any evidence that this is actually what we do? Uh, and so a, a wonderful experimental example of this is by Allen and Brooks in 1991. Now, they did an experiment um, at heart very similar to the um, random uh, random dot pattern experiment. So they did this. They, they trained participants to recognize um, animals, creatures, whether they were in one of two categories, builders or diggers. And the rule was the following. Uh, the rule was to be a builder, you need to have at least two of the following three features. You need to have long legs, um, uh, kind of a... Um, uh, an angular, an angular body um, and spots, uh, sorry, or spots. So if you have any two of these, then you're a builder. Else, you're a digger, okay? And you can see here an example of a digger. Um, and then what they did is they then shown, uh, showed, uh, so they first trained them on, you know, a number of uh, examples. And then they would show new examples and ask them to categorize them if they were builders or diggers. So for example, one type of new builder would be a builder that, for example, was physically very similar to the builders that participants had seen in the past. So for example, this has this, you know, the same square kind of angular body and long legs. But then some of the builders instead would also be very different physically from the builders seen when they were studying them. Uh, and they might look like this, right? And, and notice these animals have long legs and spots. So they very clearly, by the rule, these are clearly builders. However, physically, they look much more similar to the diggers. And so the question is how often will participants mistaken these for being diggers versus these for being diggers? If we use the rule, then participants should equally look at these and say, these are all obviously builders. However, it turns out that um, creatures, new, new creatures that were physically similar to the exemplars that participants had seen during training, they only mistaken them for diggers just about 20% of the times. However, the new creatures, that were, even though they clearly are um, builders by the rule, but they look physically, they don't look like uh, builders. Physically, they look like diggers. And so these get mistaken for diggers up to 45% of the time. So clear, even though, as I said, they have long leg and spots, so they're perfectly eligible to being, they, they, they abide by the rules of being a builder. Yet, Participants look at them and misclassify them almost, fit, you know, all, almost half of the time. So this must mean that people, instead of using the rule in order to categorize new creatures, um, they seem to use a criterion of how similar is the new creature to creatures I've seen before. So this is good evidence that people actually use um, information from the exemplars they have seen in the past. So essentially saying that it's not true that as the prototype theory used to uh, said, it's not true that people uh, forget 
sort of the exemplars, you actually carry them with you. Now, overall, uh, researchers tend to agree that we probably flexibly categorize using either prototypes extracted from what we've encountered before or actual exemplars that we have encountered according to the circumstance. However, it is also true that both the exemplar and pro prototype theory have severe limitations. And these relate to three points in particular. First, the typicality rate, ratings, the meaning of these is not necessarily clear. Um, see, uh, Armstrong, Gleitman, and Gleitman did an experiment in which they asked participants um, first to categorize numbers as, I mean, among many other items, but numbers uh, as even or odd. Um, and, and participants had no problem telling apart even and odd numbers. Then they did ask, you know, is, is three, how typical is three of an odd number? And how typical is 447, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that systematically, people view numbers like three to be much more typical of being odd than, say, 447. And, and this is systematic. And it makes no sense because the, the category of oddness doesn't have fuzzy boundaries. It's very well defined. And yet we behave as if it had fuzzy boundaries and therefore we have these uh, judgments of, um, of uh, similarity. So there is a worry that these, uh, excuse me, typicality judgments actually might just be, you know, the fruit of the experimental design of how we ask questions. Just for example, maybe when we ask how typical is something, what people understand is how familiar is this with respect to a certain category. So this might actually invalidate the whole idea that the reason we get this typicality ratings is because categories have fuzzy boundaries. Second, um, both the prototype and exemplar theory, um, what they give you is sort of a continuum of, you know, super typical of a category and completely atypical of a category. Um, yet our intuitions don't, don't really work this way. Either something, you know, a tomato, it's either a fruit or it's a vegetable. It's not, you know, it's not 51% uh, fruit and 49% vegetable. Therefore, I'll go with fruit. That, that's just not how our minds work. When we see something, we just categorize it, you're, you're in or out, it's all or, all or none. Uh, and in the sense, neither prototype nor exemplar theory give you a good, you know, a good cutoff, you know, you're in or you're out and that's it. And finally, both are based on this idea of similarity. The fact that, well, the next exemplar you, you, you meet is similar to either a prototype or previous exemplars you've, you've encountered. But as a notion, similarity is actually extremely vague. Um, you know, the, the frame of reference, for example, for similarity, what matters for similarity is very unclear. Look, take two animals, take, um, um, take uh, a penguin and a, and a puffin. Are they similar? Well, yeah, right, they're, they're very similar. They're kind of they're cousins in a sense. They have some similar colors. They sort of tend to live in sort of similar type environments. Um, uh, so extremely similar. However, you know what? Puffins actually fly. So in that sense, very different. Um, and of course, if I said, well, is a penguin more similar to a puffin or to a horse? You would say, well, definitely to a puffin. I mean, um, penguin and horse, they really don't share almost anything. However, if I were to tell you, hey, um, is our penguin and, and horse, uh, are they more similar than penguin and old radio? And then you'd say, yeah, definitely. Penguin and horse are way more similar than penguin and radio. They're both animals, uh, you know, that sort of thing. They're both alive. Uh, they both, uh, I don't know, run around. You know, a radio doesn't do any of these things. However, now that I think of it, actually, the penguin and the radio are pretty similar because they're both black and white and they both make noise. Um, see, what I'm getting at is that it's difficult to establish firmly what do we mean by similarity? Similarity is a very vague concept. It's hard to tell what is the frame of reference, what matters with respect to similarity. Um, and yet, uh, when, when people ask us, we seem to have very clear ideas as to what counts for similarity. 
However, neither theory accommodates this kind of thing. And see, the idea that similarity is a very vague and context-dependent um, construct is, is made very, was made very clear by an experiment by Doug Medin. Um, well, he showed um, the sort of slightly ambiguous uh, figures, such as this figure that you see right here in B. And the idea, the question was, is this a, a three-dimensional object? See, sort of, right, you can see here the, the lower bay, the lower face and the upper face up here. Is this a three-dimensional object or is it a two-dimensional object? Is it flat? Look at it. Is it flat or does it look like it's a, a solid? Turns out that when you ask people, it depends, their answer depends. If you put it nearby this object, then people will say it's a three-dimensional object. But if you put it nearby this object, people will say it's two-dimensional object. So you can see how the representation of certain things depends entirely on its context. So, uh, so our judgments of similarity depend, um, depend very much on, um, uh, on the context. So both the understanding of what are the relevant features when we have to determine if two things are similar or not, uh, as well as you know these sort of um, context effects, neither of these are accommodated by the prototype or exemplar theories uh, of categorization. 